Hello, everyone, and welcome to Soft Stories. I'm Stratton, and this is Pepper, and today we are going to be continuing our reading of The Borrowers by Mary Norton. This edition with illustrations by Diana Stanley. Before we jump in to our reading for today, I just wanted to express something that I have done over the last few of our little get-togethers that I am hoping, with the assistance of my wonderful girlfriend, to present to you a special episode before the end of the year, a riff on the ideas presented by First We Feast in their series Hot Ones, a show which both of us have taken an immediate and rather intense liking to we decided it would be fun to give it a go on our own and to present the results to all of you as a soft-spoken Q&A. Whether I will be able to maintain the level of composure for which I strive on this series during such a ordeal, I'm not entirely sure, but I look forward to finding out. In order to orchestrate a Q and A, though, I need some cues that can be aid. If you have been watching the series for some time, or if you are new to us, please Leave a comment in this or another video, letting me know any questions you might have about the creation of the series, about me, about the books that we have read, or what we might read in the future. I would be delighted to get to know you a little better through those questions. We will read the questions on the episode, and give you a shout out as well, if that's something that you're interested in. I have really been looking forward to finding a way to engage more with the viewers of this series. It always heartens me greatly when someone comments or likes, but I don't really feel comfortable asking for those things in most videos. But as I said, Without questions, there can be no answers, and so I'm doing so now, breaking that little rule of mine. Thank you for humouring me at the start of this video, and I look forward to seeing what questions we get and what answers I can come up with. But enough of business. Now to pleasure. The pleasure of reading together. A pleasure I so enjoy. Thank you for joining me as we begin chapter 13 of The Borrowers by Mary Norton. Homily was ironing, bending and banging and pushing the hair back out of her eyes. All round the room, Underclothes hung airing on safety pins, which homily used like coat hangers. What happened? asked homily. Did you fall over? Yes, said Arietti, moving quietly into her place beside the fire. How's the feeling coming? Oh, I don't know, said Arietti. She clasped her knees and laid her chin on them. Where's your knitting? asked Homily. I don't know what's come over you lately. Always idle. 
You don't feel seedy, do you? Oh, exclaimed Arietty, let me be. And Homily, for once, was silent. It's the spring, she told herself. Used to make me like that sometimes at her age. I must see that boy, Arietty was thinking, staring blindly into the fire. I must hear what happened. I must hear if they're all right. I don't want us to die out. I don't want to be the last borrower. I don't want... And here, Arietty dropped her face onto her knees. To live for ever and ever like this, in the dark, under the floor. No good getting supper, said Homily, breaking the silence. Your father's gone borrowing, to her room, and you know what that means. Arietty raised her head. No, she said, hardly listening. What does it mean? That he won't be back, said Homily sharply, for a good hour and a half. He likes it up there, gossiping with her and poking about on the dressing table. And it's safe enough once that boy's in bed. Not that there's anything we want special, she went on. It's just these new shelves he's made. They look kind of bare, he says. And he might, he says, just pick up a little something. Arietty suddenly was sitting bolt upright. A thought had struck her, leaving her breathless and a little shaky at the knees. A good hour and a half, her mother had said, and the gates would be open. Where are you going? asked Homily, as Arietty moved towards the door. Just along to the storerooms said Arietty, shading with one hand her candle dip from the draught. I won't be long. Now, don't you untidy anything, Homily called out after her, and be careful of that light. As Arietty went down the passage, she thought, It is true, I am going to the storerooms to find another hat pin, and if I do find a hat pin, and a piece of string, there won't be any name tape. I still won't be long, because I'll have to get back before Papa. And I'm doing it for their sakes, she told herself doggedly. And one day, they'll thank me. <sighs> All the same, she felt a little guilty. Artful, that's what Mrs. Driver would say she was. There was a hat pin, one with a bar for a top, and she tied on a piece of string very firmly, twisting it back and forth like a figure of eight, and, as a crowning inspiration, she sealed it with sealing wax. The gates were open, and she left the candle in the middle of the passage, where it could come to no harm, just below the hole by the clock. The great dim hall, where she had climbed out into, was dark with shadows. A single gas jet, turned low, made a pool of light beside the locked front door, and another faintly flickered on the landing, halfway up the stairs. The ceiling sprang away into height and darkness, and all around was space. The night nursery, she knew, was at the end of the upstairs passage, and the boy would be in bed. Her mother had just said so. Arietti had watched her father use his pin on the chair and single stairs. In comparison, were easier. There was a kind of rhythm to it after a while. A throw, a pull, a scramble and an upward swing. The stair rods glinted coldly, but the pile of the carpet seemed soft and warm 
and delicious to fall back on. On the half landing she paused to get her breath. She did not mind the semi-darkness. She lived in darkness. She was at home in it. And, at a time like this, it made her feel safe. On the upper landing she saw an open door and a great square of golden light, which like a barrier lay across the passage. I've got to pass through that, Arietti told herself, trying to be brave. Inside the lighted room, a voice was talking, groaning on. And this mare, the voice said, was a five-year-old, which really belonged to my brother in Ireland. Not my older brother, but my younger brother. The one who owned Stalemate, and oh, my darling. He had entered her for several point to points, but when I say several, I mean two, uh, or three at least. Have you ever seen an Irish point to point? No, said another voice, rather absent mindedly. That's my father, Arietti realised with a start. My father talking to great-aunt Sophie, or rather, great-aunt Sophie talking to my father. She gripped her pin with its loops of string and ran into the light and threw it to the passage beyond. As she passed the open door, she had a glimpse of firelight and lamplight and gleaming furniture and dark red silk brocade. Beyond the square of light, the passage was dark again, and she could see, at the far end, a half-open door. That's the day nursery, she thought, and beyond that is the night nursery. There are certain differences, Aunt Sophie's voice went on which would strike you at once. For instance, Arietti liked the voice. It was comforting and steady, like the sound of the clock in the hall. And as she moved off the carpet onto the strip of polished floor beside the skirting board, she was interested to hear that there were walls in Ireland instead of hedges. Here, by the skirting, she could run, and she loved running. Carpets were heavy going, thick and clinging. They held you up. The boards were smooth and smelled of beeswax. She liked the smell. The schoolroom, school when she reached it, was shrouded in dust sheets and full of junk. Here, too, a gas jet burned, turned low to a bluish flame. The floor was oilcloth, rather worn, and the rugs were shabby. Under the table was a great cavern of darkness. She moved into it, feeling about, and bumped into a dusty hassock higher than her head. Coming out again, into the half-light, she looked up and saw the corner covered with the doll's tea service, the painting above the fireplace, and the plush curtain where her father had been seen. Chair legs were everywhere, and chair seats obscured her view. She found her way among them to the door of the night nursery, and there she saw, suddenly, on a shadowed plateau in the far corner, the boy in bed. She saw his great face, turned towards her on the edge of the pillow. She saw the gaslight, reflected in his open eyes. She saw his hand, gripping the bedclothes, holding them tightly pressed against his mouth. She stopped moving and stood still. After a while, when she saw his fingers relax, she said softly, don't be frightened. 
It's me, Arietti. He let the bedclothes slide away from his mouth and said, Ari Watty? He seemed annoyed. Eddie, she repeated gently, did you take the letter? He stared at her for a moment without speaking, and then he said, Why did you come creeping, creeping into my room? I didn't come creeping, creeping, said Arietti. I even ran. Didn't you see? He was silent, staring at her with his great, wide, open eyes. When I brought the book, he said at last, you'd gone. I had to go. Tea was ready. My father fetched me. He understood this. Oh, he said, matter-of-factly, and did not reproach her. Did you take the letter? she asked again. Yes, he said. I had to go back twice. I shoved it down the badger hole. Suddenly, he threw back the bedclothes and stood up in bed, enormous in his pale flannel nightshirt. It was Arietti's turn to be afraid. She half turned, her eyes on his face, and began backing slowly towards the door. But he did not look at her. He was feeling behind a picture on the wall. Here it is, he said, sitting down again, and the bed creaked loudly. But I don't want it back, exclaimed Arietti, coming forward again. You should have left it there. Why did you bring it back? He turned it over in his fingers. He's written on it, he said. Oh, please, cried Arietti excitedly. Show me. And here we can see the boy in bed, looking behind the picture, and just down here in the corner, Arietti, with her little pin, unsure of what is to come next. She ran right up to the bed and tugged at the trailing sheet. Then they are alive. Did you see them? No, he said. The letter was there, just down the hole where I'd put it. He leaned towards her, but he's written on it. Look. She made a quick dart and almost snatched the letter out of his great fingers, but was careful to keep out of range of his grasp. She ran with it to the door of the schoolroom, where the light, though dim, was a little brighter. It's very faint, she said, holding it close to her eyes. What's he written it with, I wonder? It's all in capitals. She turned suddenly. Are you sure you didn't write it? She asked. Of course not. He began. I write small. But she had seen by his face that he spoke the truth and began to spell out the letters. T-E-double-L, she said. Tell Y-O-R-E, she looked up. Your, she said. Yes, said the boy, your. Tell your A-N-T, aunt, said Arietti. Aunt, my aunt. The boy was silent, waiting. Aunt... L-U-O, Aunt Loopy, she exclaimed. He says, listen, this is what it says. Tell your Aunt Loopy to come home. 
there was silence. Then tell her, said the boy, after a moment. But she isn't here, exclaimed Ariete. She's never been here. I don't even remember what she looked like. Look, said the boy, staring through the door. Someone's coming. Here we can see the letter with its unfortunate misspellings and the extra P in Aunt Lupi's name. Ariete whipped round. There was no time to hide. It was Pod, borrowing bag in one hand and pin in the other. He stood in the doorway of the schoolroom. Quite still, he stood. Outlined against the light in the passage, his little shadow falling dimly in front of him. He had seen her. I heard your voice he said, and there was a dreadful quietness about the way he spoke, just as I was coming out of her room. Ariete stared back at him, stuffing the letter up her jersey. Could he see beyond her, into the shadowed room? Could he see the tussled shape in bed? Come on home, said Pod and turned away. Chapter 14 Pod did not speak until they reached the sitting room, nor did he look at her. She had had to scramble after him as best she might. He had ignored her efforts to help him shut the gates, but once, when she tripped, he had waited until she had got up again. Watching her, it seemed, almost without interest, while she brushed the dust off her knees. Supper was laid and the ironing put away, and Homily came running in from the kitchen, surprised to see them together. Pod threw down his borrowing bag. He stared at his wife. What's the matter? faltered Homily looking from one to the other. She was in the night nursery, faltered, uh, said Pod quietly, talking to that boy. Homily moved forward, her hands clasped, trembling against her apron, her startled eyes flicking swiftly to and fro. Oh no, she breathed. Pod sat down. He ran a tired hand over his eyes and forehead. His face looked heavy, like a piece of dough. Now what? he said. Homily stood quite still. Bowed she stood over her clasped hands and stared at Ariete. Oh, you never, she whispered. They're frightened, Ariete realized. They're not angry at all. They are very, very frightened. She moved forward. It's all right, she began. Homily sat down suddenly on the cotton reel. She had begun to tremble. Oh, she said, whatever shall we do? She began to rock herself very slightly to and fro. Oh, mother, don't, pleaded Ariete. It isn't so bad as that. It really isn't. She felt up the letter up the front of her jersey. At first she could not find the letter. It had slid round her side to the back, but at last she drew it out, very crumpled. Look, 
she said. Here's a letter from Uncle Hendreary. I wrote to him, and the boy took the letter. We can see here, lit by the firelight in the kitchen, Ariety revealing the letter to her frightened parents. I love the way that the artist Diana Stanley was able to so effectively utilise light in her drawings here. I think they're very well done. You wrote to him? cried Homily on a kind of suppressed shriek. Oh, she moaned and closed her eyes. Whatever next, whatever shall we do? And she fanned herself limply with her bony hand. Get your mother a drink of water, Arietti, said Pod sharply. Arietti brought it in a sawn-off hazel shell. It had been sawn off at the pointed end and was shaped like a brandy glass. But whatever made you do such a thing, Arietti? said Homily more calmly, setting the empty cup down on the table. Whatever came over you? So Arietti told them about being seen that morning under the cherry tree, and how she had kept it from them, not to worry them, and what the boy said about dying out, and how, more than important, how imperative it had seemed to make sure that the Hendrearies were alive. I do understand, pleaded Ariety. Please understand. I'm trying to save the race. The expressions she uses, said Homily to Pod under her breath, not without pride. But Pod was not listening. Save the race, he repeated grimly. It's people like you, my girl, who do things sudden like, with no respect for tradition, who will finish us borrowers once for all. Don't you see what you've done? Arietti met his accusing eyes. Yes, she said, falteringly. I've... I've got in touch with the only other one still alive. So that, she went on, bravely, from now on we can all stick together. All stick together, Pod repeated angrily. Do you think... Hendreary's lot would ever come back to live here. Can you see your mother emigrating to a badger's set two fields away, out in the open, and no hot water laid on? Never! cried Homily in a full, rich voice, which made them both turn and look at her. Or... Do you see your mother walking across two fields and a garden? Went on Pod. Two fields full of crows and cows and horses and what not. To take a cup of tea with your Aunt Loopy, whom she never liked much anyway. But wait, he said, as Ariette tried to speak. That's not the point. As far as all that goes... We're just where we was. The point, he went on, leaning forward and speaking with great solemnity, is this. That boy knows now where we live. Oh, no, said Ariete. I never told him that. I... You told him, interrupted Pod, about the kitchen pipe. Bursting. You told him how all our stuff got washed away to the grating. He sat back again, glaring at her. He's only got to think, he pointed out. 
Ariety was silent, and Pod went on. Oh, that's a thing that has never happened before. Never in the whole long history of the borrowers. Borrowers have been seen. Yes, borrowers have been caught. Maybe. But no human being has ever known where any borrower lived. We're in very grave danger, Arietti. And you've put us there. And that's a fact. Oh, Pod, whimpered Homily, don't frighten the child. Nay, Homily, said Pod more gently, my poor old girl. I don't want to frighten no one, but this is serious. Suppose I said to you, pack up tonight, all our bits and pieces. Where would you go? Not to Hendreary's, cried Homily. Not there, Pod. Oh, I could never share a kitchen with Loopy. No, agreed Pod. Not to Hendreary's. And don't you see for why? The boy knows about that, too. Oh, cried Homily in real dismay. Yes, said Pod. A couple of smart terriers, or a well-trained ferret, and that would be the end of that lot. Oh, Pod, said Homily, and began again to tremble. The thought of living in a badger's set had been bad enough, but the thought of not having even that to go to seemed almost worse. And I dare say I could have got it quite nice in the end, she said, providing we lived quite separate. Well, it's no good thinking of that now, said Pod. He turned to Ariete. What does your Uncle Hendreary say in his letter? Yes, exclaimed Homily. Where's this letter? It, uh, it doesn't say much said Ariety, passing over the paper. It just says, tell your Aunt Loopy to come home. What? exclaimed Homily sharply, looking at the letter upside down. Come home? What can he mean? He means, said Pod, that Loopy must have set off to come here, and that she never arrived. Set off to come here, repeated Homily. But when? How should I know? said Pod. It doesn't say when, said Ariety. But, exclaimed Homily, it might have been weeks ago. It might, said Pod. Long enough anyway for him to want her back. Oh, cried Homily, all oh, those poor little children. They're growing up now. But something must have happened to her, exclaimed Homily. Yes, said Pod. He turned to Ariety. See what I mean, Ariety, about those fields? Oh, Pod, said Homily, her eyes full of tears. I don't suppose none of us will ever see poor Loopy again. Well, we wouldn't have anyway, said Pod. Oh, Pod, said Homily soberly, I'm frightened. Everything seems to be happening at once. What are we going to do? Well, said Pod, there's nothing we can do tonight, that's certain. But have a bit of supper and a good night's rest. He rose to his feet. Oh, Harrietty, wailed Homily suddenly. You naughty, wicked girl. How could you go and start all this? How could you go and talk to a human being? If only... I was seen, 
cried Arietty. I couldn't help being seen. Papa was seen. I don't think it's all as awful as you're trying to make out. I don't think human beings are all that bad. They're bad and they're good, said Pard. They're honest and they're artful. It's just as it takes them at the moment. And animals, if they could talk, would say the same. Steer clear of them. That's what I've always been told. No matter what they promise you, no good never really came from no one, from any human being. Chapter 15 That night, while Ariete lay straight and still under her cigar box ceiling, Homily and Pod talked for hours. They talked in the sitting room, they talked in the kitchen, and later, much later, she heard them talk in their bedroom. She heard drawers shutting and opening, doors creaking, and boxes being pulled out from under beds. What are they doing? she wondered. What will happen next? Very still she lay in her soft little bed, with her familiar belongings around her. Her postage stamp view of Rio Harbour, her silver pig of a charm bracelet, her turquoise ring, which sometimes, for fun, she would wear as a crown, and, dearest of all, her floating ladies with the golden trumpets, tooting above their peaceful town. She did not want to lose these, she realised suddenly, lying there straight and still in bed. But to have all the other things as well, adventure and safety mixed, that's what she wanted. And that, the restless bangings and whisperings told her, is just what you couldn't do. As it happened, Homily was only fidgeting, opening drawers and shutting them, unable to be still. And she ended up, when Pod was already in bed, by deciding to curl her hair. Now, Homily, Pod protested wearily, lying there in his nightshirt, there's really no call for that. Who's going to see you? That's just it exclaimed Homily, searching in a drawer for her curl rags. In times like this, one never knows. I'm not going to be caught out, she said irritably, turning the drawer upside down and picking over the spilled contents. With me hair, like this. She came to bed at last, looking spiky, like a washed-out gollywog and Pod with a sigh turned over at last and closed his eyes. Homily lay for a long time, staring at the oil lamp. It was the silver cap of a scent bottle with a tiny floating wick. She felt unwilling, for some reason, to blow it out. There were movements upstairs in the kitchen above her, and it was late for movements. The household should be asleep, and the lumpy curlers pressed uncomfortably against her neck. She gazed, just as Ariete had done, about the familiar room. Too full, she realised, with little bags and boxes and makeshift cupboards, and thought, What now? Perhaps nothing will happen after all. The child perhaps is right, and we're making a good deal of fuss about nothing very much. This boy, when all's said and done, is only a guest. Perhaps, thought Homily, he'll go away again quite soon. And that, she told herself drowsily, will be that. 
Later, as she realised afterwards, she must have dozed off, because it seemed she was crossing Parkin's Beck. It was night, and the wind was blowing and the field seemed very steep. She was scrambling up it, along the ridge by the gas pipe, sliding and falling in the wet grass. The trees, it seemed to Holly, were threshing and clashing, their branches waving and sawing against the sky. Then, as she told them many weeks later, there was a sound of splintering wood. And Homily woke up. She saw the room again and the oil, flam oil lamp flickering. But something, she knew at once, was different. There was a strange draught, and her mouth felt dry and full of grit. Then she looked up at the ceiling. Pod! she shrieked, clutching his shoulder. Pod rolled over and sat up. They both stared at the ceiling. The whole surface was on a steep slant, and one side of it had come right away from the wall. This was what had caused the draught. And down into the room, to within an inch of the foot of the bed, protruded a curious object. A huge bar of grey steel with a flattened, shining edge. It's a screwdriver, said Pod. They stared at it, fascinated, unable to move, and for a moment all was still. Then, slowly the huge object swayed upwards until the sharp edge lay against their ceiling, and Homily heard a scrape on the floor above, and a sudden human gasp. Oh, my knees! cried Homily. Oh, my feeling! As, with a splintering wrench, their whole roof flew off and fell down with a clatter somewhere out of sight. Homily screamed then, but this time it was a real scream, loud and shrill and hearty. She seemed almost to settle down in her scream while her eyes stared up, half interested into empty lighted space. There was another ceiling, she realised, away up above them, higher, it seemed, than the sky. A ham hung from it and two strings of onions. Arietti appeared in the doorway, scared and trembling, clutching her nightgown, and Pod slapped Homily's back. Have done, he said. That's enough. And Homily, suddenly, was quiet. A great face appeared then between them and that distant height. It wavered above them, smiling and terrible. There was silence, and Homily sat bolt upright, her mouth open. Is that your mother? asked a surprised voice after a moment, and Arietti, from the doorway, whispered. Yes. It was the boy. Pod got out of bed and stood beside it, shivering in his nightshirt. Come on, he said to Homily. You can't stay there. But Homily could. She had her old nightdress on with the patch in the back and nothing was going to move her. A slow anger was rising up in Homily. She had been caught in her hair curlers. Pod had raised his hand to her, and she remembered that in the general turmoil and for once in her life she had left the supper washing up for morning, and there it would be on the kitchen table for all the world to see. She glared at the boy. He was only a child after all. Put it back, she said. Put it back at once. Her eyes flashed and her curlers seemed to quiver. He knelt down then, but Homily did not flinch as the great face came slowly closer. She saw his underlip, pink and full, like an enormous exaggeration of Arietti's, 
and she saw it wobble slightly. But I've got something for you, he said. Homily's expression did not change, and Ariete called out from her place in the doorway, What have you got? The boy reached behind him, and, very gingerly, careful to keep it upright, he held a wooden object above their heads. It's this, he said, and carefully, his tongue out and breathing heavily, he lowered the object slowly into their hole. It was a doll's dresser, complete with plates. It had two drawers in it and a cupboard below. He adjusted its position at the foot of Homily's bed. Ariete ran round to see better. Oh, she cried ecstatically. Mother, look! Homily threw the dresser a glance. It was dark oak, and the plates were hand-painted. And then she looked away again, quickly. Yes, she said. It's very nice. There was a short silence, which no one knew how to break. The cupboard really opens, said the boy at last and the great hand came down all amongst them, smelling of bath soap. Ariete flattened herself against the wall, and Pod exclaimed, nervous, Now then. Yes, agreed Homily after a moment. I see it does. Pod drew a long breath. A sigh of relief as the hand went back. There, Homily, he said, placating the, you've always wanted something like that. Yes, said Homily. She still sat bolt upright, her hands clasped in her lap. Thank you very much. And... Now, she went on coldly, will you please put back the roof? Wait a minute, pleaded the boy. Again he reached behind him, again the hand came down. And there, beside the dresser, there was barely room for it, was a very small doll's chair. It was a Victorian chair, upholstered, in red velvet. Oh! Ariete exclaimed again, and Pod said shyly, Just about fit me, that would. Try it, begged the boy, and Pod threw him a nervous glance. Go on, said Ariete, and Pod sat down, in his nightshirt, his bare feet showing. That's nice, he said after a moment. It would go by the fire in the sitting room, cried Ariete. It would look lovely on red blotting paper. Let's try it, said the boy, and the hand came down again. Pod sprang up just in time to steady the dresser as the red velvet chair was whisked away above his head and placed, presumably, in the next room but one. Ariete ran out of the door and along the passage to see it. Oh, she called out to her parents, come and see, it's lovely. We can see here the boy extending his hand down to reposition the nice Victorian chair. But Pod and Homily did not move. The boy was leaning over them, breathing hard, and they could see the middle buttons of his nightshirt. 
he seemed to be examining the farther room. What do you keep in that mustard pot? he asked. Coal, said Ariete's voice, and I helped to borrow this new carpet. Here's the watch I told you about, and the pictures. I could get you some better stamps than those, the boy said. I've got some jubilee ones with the Taj Mahal. Look, cried Ariete's voice again, and Pod took Homily's hand. These are my books. Homily clutched Pod as the great hand came down once more in the direction of Ariete. Quiet, he whispered. Sit still. The boy, it seemed, was touching the books. What are they called? he asked, and Ariete reeled off the names. Pod, whispered Homily, I'm going to scream. No, whispered Pod, you mustn't, not again. I feel it coming on. Pod looked worried. Hold your breath, he said, and count to ten. The boy was saying to Ariete, Why couldn't you read me those? Well, I could, said Ariete, but I'd rather read something new. But you never come, complained the boy. I know, said Ariete, but I will. Pod, whispered Homily, did you hear that? Did you hear what she said? Yes, yes, Pod whispered. Keep quiet. Do you want to see the storerooms? Ariete suggested next, and Homily clapped a hand to her mouth as though to stifle a cry. Pod looked up at the boy. Hey, he called, trying to attract his attention. The boy looked down. Put the roof back now. Pod begged him, trying to sound matter-of-fact and reasonable. We're getting cold. All right, agreed the boy, but he seemed to hesitate. He reached across them for the piece of board which formed their roof. Shall I nail you down? he asked, and they saw him pick up the hammer it swayed above them, very dangerous looking. Of course, night us down. I mean, said the boy, I've got some more things upstairs. Pod looked uncertain, and Homily nudged him. Ask him, she whispered, what kind of things? What kind? Of things? asked Pod. Things from an old doll's house. There is on the top shelf of the cupboard by the fireplace in the schoolroom. I've never seen no doll's house, said Pod. Well, it's in the cupboard, said the boy, right up by the ceiling. You can't see it. You've got to climb on the lower shelves to get to it. What sort of things are there in the doll's house? Asked Ariete from the sitting room. Oh, everything. Carpets and rugs and beds with mattresses. And there's a bird in a cage. Not a real one, of course. And cooking pans and tables and five gilt chairs, and a pot with a palm in it, a dish of plaster tarts and an imitation leg of mutton. Homily leaned across to Pod. Tell him to nail us down lightly, she whispered. Pod stared at her, and she nodded vigorously, clasping her hands, Pod turned to the boy. All right, he said. You nail us down. 
but lightly if you see what I mean. Just a tap or two here and there. And that, my friends, is where we will leave the clock family and their new interior decorator for now. Thank you so much for joining me today on Soft Stories on a very wet and weary day here where I am. I hope that wherever you are, you are enjoying a pleasant moment of reflection, no matter the weather. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. I do so look forward to our little visits. Until next we meet, I wish you all the best, and goodbye.